All right, good afternoon. Hopefully this will be good after everyone's lunch. Um, I'm really shifting gears here, okay? I'm not gonna be giving a technical presentation. Uh, my name is Rene Pronovo. I'm Vice President of Operations and Services at Maya. kind of wear two hats. Uh, my background has just been like I'm a project guy. Throughout my whole career, I like doing projects. I've been projecting the automotive industry, business jets, nuclear power plants, um, and just tackling tough projects, uh, both at work and at life. I like triathlons, CrossFit, all that stuff. So as soon as it's painful, for some reason, I like it. So, you know, there's always reward in doing hard things. Um, so today, I'm mostly putting on my operations hat with this whole chat GPT conversation. Um, like everyone, I think in the last six months here, we've been like, we keep hearing this, and it's like, well, what do I do with it? So today's a little bit of a storyline over the last months of what Maya's been looking at, what we've considered, what we've learned, and where we're going with this, uh, just because we're trying to figure it out like a lot of people are. So I'm sharing some insight on what we found on that today. So AI, who here finds now that AI is just sprinkled everywhere on top of everything? Do you guys think it's kind of thrown around too much too easily by raise of hands? Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'm seeing it in every headline all the time, and you're like, is this true? What is it? I've seen people demo me software, and they're like, eh, we got AI in it. And I'm like, this is just fuzzy logic. What are you talking about? There's no AI in here. So I think there's definitely some hype, and understanding what the difference between the hype is and what you can actually do is important, um, also from an engineer perspective. Um, so coincidentally, it's about a year anniversary since ChatGPT came out. This is just from Google Trends, which I like to do to check out to see what's going on. Uh, and what you can see is since last November it came out and really like I think like February, March, things got really hot in the news and everyone started playing with it. What can we do? Uh, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride there in the sense that, okay, well, everyone gets excited about it. But at the same time, I don't know if you remember uh, a few months back, it was like, Watch out, copyrights, what do we do with this? Privacy, they're training on your data. So I went, whoops, I went through, I think last May, I sat down with everyone in my company, I said, do not touch ChatGPT, we can't trust it. And then like a few weeks later, I find out, well, everyone's still using it anyways, because it's kind of a fun tool to use. So let's try to figure out how we can use it and what can it do for real. Um, and it's been a bit conflicting. So like even then, I don't know if you remember, uh, Elon Musk said, guys, we should stop all development that's gonna be stronger than ChatGPT because you know there's no control, there's no ethics, what's going on, everyone stop. And then I think just a few weeks ago, he launched his own tool, right? So stop, go, what's going on? How, how do I navigate this now? So my, my job at Maya is to make sure that my team and my business is running efficiently, we're using the best practices, the best tools. Um, you know, so how do I navigate this and what am I allowed to do? What can I do? And even recently now we're talking about generative AI and large language models and vector databases. Like, what does this mean? How do I do this? Where, where do we go? So um, I'm gonna just simplify the reflection right now. And, whoops, sorry. I'm just gonna simplify the reflection. Like, AI, for us, uh, it's been around for a while. We've been using AI and machine learning on simulation uh, to do you know, digital twins and reduced order models. Um, and then we started doing it on manufacturing data, operation data, so predictors and optimizations and quality control. And so now the conversation with, you know, these natural language processing or chatbots um, is really augmenting people's productivity. And I think, uh, to me, it's not a surprise, and I'm quoting a friend of mine, so Remy is a, one of my colleagues at Maya who will be here very shortly. He's a resident AI expert. Um, and I think what happened is, and I like his quote, he says, with ChatGPT, all of a sudden, everyone has woken up to a very specific example of something they can use to augment themselves. So we went from augmenting simulation to operation to manufacturing to now people, and it's just this new thing. But uh, ultimately, I'm, I think we're embracing the change and, uh, or this new capabilities. We're just wondering how do we use it. So I put this link up there. I encourage you to grab it. It's a nice podcast that was done with him and Siemens jointly a few months back talking about this. Uh, and uh, exploring a little bit to where, where things are going. But for today's presentation, um, why am I talking about this? Well, my interest is, oops, sorry, is how can I augment my team, my people, right? Of course, that may translate to things that we can offer to our customers, but how do I make my team's work more interesting and more efficient? Uh, I had a little bit of FOMO, fear of missing out, like a lot of people, so at first I said, no, don't touch this, and then, oh no, wait a second, we can't miss the boat on this, and we have to understand it. Um, we went forward with caution, so everything that we did, we're very careful, I'll talk about later. 
But one of the topics is, you know, for engineers, um, accuracy and reliability is important. So there's a difference between asking to write a creative marketing post versus I'm trying to solve this problem, what's the right way to solve it, and am I getting good results, right? And that's where I think there is a, 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 there'll be a noticeable gap in where we are today. And someone was asking me earlier, do I have to worry about losing my job in the next few years? I'm one of those people who doesn't think so. I think we can work with AI, work with these tools, and it's just a question how to work with them that we have to navigate. So um, what this presentation is not, I'm not talking about ethics, being alarmist on AI, financial economics, and stuff like that. I'm simply gonna to talk to you about how we went from some early stage experimentation a few months ago to now some active development, what we're doing now and what we're doing next, uh, trying to leverage this uh, new, new, new technology. I did this by asking three of my teams what they would do. So this is how I approached this a few months back when I finally, oh my God, sorry. Um, when we said, okay, how can I leverage this? I went to my simulation team and said, guys, play with it. What can you do with it? I went to the Annex Open team, so Elias that you met earlier, and some of the people there, hey, what can you guys do with this? I went to people in Flow's team and said, what can you guys do with this? And that's what I'm gonna walk through today. Um, just so I don't spend too much time on this, I wanted to give a little bit of background on ChatGPT. Who hasn't played with ChatGPT? Okay, so everyone's played with it a little bit? Okay. Um, in a nutshell, Chatbot, you guys know it. There's some fun image generation. I won't speak about that. You saw some examples earlier. Um, and there's an API that you can leverage to augment the amount of interaction that you can have. I'll leave it at that. The key things that I want to note is that um, it's just optimized to produce plausible sounding language. Okay, so every time, and you guys have probably, if you've experimented with it, found some goofy case scenarios, but I'm bringing that up because it's not a truth model. Just because it says it doesn't mean it's true. It's just the most plausible sequence of words that would come out from your query. That's all it is, right? So you have to keep that in perspective when we're looking at accuracy for engineering. And um, if ever you're looking for another good podcast, sorry, I don't have the link here, but Lex Friedman did one with the OpenAI CEO and a very interesting one, and he was talking about how it's just a very much a public work in progress right now is the way they're experimenting. I think they've developed this and they're using everyone's interaction with it to improve the model, okay? So I encourage everyone to go do their experimentation for those who haven't yet. Um, there's more than one, so I'm talking about ChatGPT today, but there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of trends as you can see over the last years. Uh, it is a bit of a competition as you can see, and you see Elon Musk is on it. Um, and just one quick, Disclaimer, um, the whole privacy point. Um, I, I, there are legal frameworks at OpenAI that talk about data protection and stuff like that. Um, I found the language has changed over the months and it depends what your level of comfort is. So if you're gonna play with it with private data or your own corporate data, I highly recommend you get approval from your legal department uh, so that they're comfortable with that. All experimentation that we did was with non-confidential data, just so you're aware, but I, I recommend that just to make sure. There is a setting, in case you didn't know, that you can go and it says, do not train on my data and erase it. Um, but still, you are throwing your data out in there, so you, know, you can ask people if they trust or they don't trust or what they wanna do, but that's the only disclaimer I'd give. So first use case, my simulation team. Um, by raise of hand, who does simulation here? I just wanna see if I'm gonna insult anyone or not when I talk about this, okay. <laughs> um, simulation guys or girls and everyone in those teams, I would say are the most, whoops, um, proudest of their work. When I came to see them and say, hey, can Chad GPT help you? I was like, probably not. Like they were just like right away, like no, no. Like they, you know, a lot of them are very smart, have advanced degrees and they were, I don't want to say cocky, but they were like, no, no, yeah, I'll, I'll prove to you that this isn't going to be useful to me. But it, but it was an interesting exp experience anyway. So their approach was, let me look at this and see if it could teach me anything, if it can help me as an intern, like do basic tasks, or, you know, is this brilliant? Is there something here that we're just, oh my God, like, yeah, this is going to be a game changer. So uh, I'll go through a few examples here and just talk about it. So um, I'll probably, question number two, the first one here, we asked, I think one of the things we noticed, when you ask, What's possible, like what turbulence models examples are available here? What can you do? It does provide good answers. It says, hey, you can do these type of simulations. But when you start asking questions more like, how do I model a satellite? Or I'm getting an error, what's the cause of this error? Or can you give me an example, a, a detailed way in how to get like a bolted joint? What margin should I use? 
It has no concept of that. We weren't able to get real deep insight into this. So if you're looking to have it like support you as a teacher while you're revving up, it'll give you general knowledge. But like, and these were all asked like around Sim Center, by the way. Um, so we didn't we didn't get too many great things there. So some insight, some usefulness, but no accuracy, no precision, no details. Um, the next was asked as an intern. So. Um, if you hire interns, we often give them some of the repetitive tasks, things that people don't want to do. That's usually the, uh, yeah, you pay your dues at the beginning. Um, so we asked it to provide some, uh, to, to provide an NX open script to generate a list of materials in Sim Center. Um, that was able to do, required some tweaking, required some knowledge, but um, uh, still it required knowledge to get it right. Um, uh, also we played then with output files, simulation output files, trying to get some temperature graphs um, and as well as input files. So um, what the challenge with output files, it actually kind of worked. We were able to take simulation output files and process them. The challenge though is the size of the files. So you can only be playing with very small files. There's a limit to how much like a chat GPT tool can ingest. So that's one of the limitations that we found. And the input files, it had no knowledge of SimCenter input files. But uh, we gave it an example, and it was actually able to give us guidance on how to update those files. So there's like baked in knowledge, and you have to kind of find those nuggets of where it is. So depending on how we ask these questions, when you gave it a little bit more, it would provide some insight. But in all cases, um, it required our expertise to complement the input. You, we couldn't, someone couldn't do this on their own and go, oh, I figured this out. It was just helping someone with expertise navigate already this information. So. Uh, again, as an intern, useful providing scripts, but still wasn't, it wasn't full-fledged results. Um, and then as a genius, well, we asked more advanced simulation questions, uh, more details around turbulence models, uh, certain coefficients as well in different uh, other, other models. And um, actually, if anything, it was yet to be very cautious because it was giving us default answers which could actually provide some error. Like it was giving you kind of a false direction to where you should go. So not understanding these models fundamentally, you'd probably go in the wrong direction. Where it was interesting though is we asked it a very specific question, and I'll jump into a, a quick video here of it running. Is it starting? Um, and this is maybe like a, a 101 uh, question for uh, mechanical engineers, and it was just calculating temperature on a heat that's dissipated with flow and, and certain heat applied to it. And what was interesting is that it was able to understand the question, provide the right equation to solve the problem, understand all the variables in the, in the problem. Uh, it was able to then relate the right values from my question to the, to, the one, to the variables in the equation. It was able to do the math right, which we've all goofed around and you can mess with Chad GPT and not get the math right. Uh, and what I was really impressed is it actually understood that the plate has two sides and factored that into the equation. So it actually did twice the heat dissipation, which you'd think, okay, it had some understanding fundamentally of this problem. Or maybe it was just part of the training data set online that it took, like who knows, right? And that's the problem, like who knows? But this type of example, I think I was talking with the, the Dean of Seneca earlier and he was saying like, how do we do, you know, how's this gonna help students? Like, I find this really helpful. Like, I don't know, when I was in mechanical engineering, if I had this explaining to me at night on Saturday night when I was studying late, like, um, yeah, this would have been very practical. So, um, one last quick point on the simulation aspect of things. Uh, around star CCM, we did have fun prompting Java macro scripts for pre-processing and Python scripts for post-processing. Um, if anything, in both cases, it was like a good start to basic automation. Like it gave us like some snippets of code that you can reuse, but again, uh, it wasn't a full-fledged automation. If you're looking to automate a whole workflow like Elias was talking earlier, you wouldn't be able to do that with what it provided to you. So, but it was a good foundation. So some of the, the tips for that would be, you know, be very descriptive and break down your process. Like if you're gonna try to simulate a whole process, don't try to automate everything at once. Choose one small part of it and then build your code together uh, and follow a step-by-step -step process. And if you're struggling with that, well, come see us at Maya. This is the type of stuff that we like to do, of course. Um, so in summary for you know, an expert advisor in simulation, from our point of view, it was still quite a spotty tool. Like fun, uh, you know, educational, but still needs validation. Uh, like an augment to Google, you'd Google and find results, you'd go in here, you'd get something, but what's right, what's wrong, you still need to digest that for yourselves. Um, 
the main promising avenue, again, was automation of repetitive tasks, so generating quick scripts to help uh, pre- post-processing. Um, but the real limitation of this is there's no 3D insight. This is a natural, you know, large language models is a natural language processing. It's, you know, we're not processing 3D. I can't throw a 3D model in there and troubleshoot why my model's not converging. Uh, there's no context to that. So I think that changes for the next scenario, though. When I ask my NX team what could we do, it's, well, okay, well, we're, we're in 3D in NX. How can we leverage this in, in NX? So I'm going to just start this example up. So I asked two teams. I have two examples uh, for our NX team uh, of how they potentially think they could use ChatGPT. So what you're seeing here is just a, it's a dummy part. And what they did is created an NX open script that scans the part attributes. So in this case, it can understand that it's a part made out of polypropylene uh, that has a certain thickness. Uh, and even, I think we were hearing earlier Guy talking about, you know, uh, model-based systems engineering. Just imagine if ChatGPT can go stand, he was talking about thousands, hundreds of pages of requirements, and maybe bring that as a summary to the designer to say, take into account these aspects. So what you're seeing here is we just integrated ChatGPT inside NX. We can call, so based on the attributes found, we send, hey, what would be some design best practices for this part, right, in ChatGPT? and uh, give a variety of things concerning, you know, material or wear and tear, resistance, uh, environmental conditions, et cetera. So things that a designer would be like, okay, I should take this into account when designing this part, okay? Now, this is really leveraging data that exists inside, whether it's Team Center or, or in the part, but it's still not 3D. So um, the next group uh, thought a little bit differently um, this example here, which you're seeing, so the first one they call it the NX Copilot. This one they just for fun call it a design advisor. Uh, instead of having an NX open script that scans the part attributes or potentially data inside Team Center, uh, this one is monitoring the log files as you're working in NX, in NX. So what that means is that let's say you're a designer here and you want to pass a chamfer on a part, it notices, oh, you're doing a chamfer. By the way, here are some best practices around chamfer, right? And uh, so you can imagine that if you're a company that has certain machining standards, certain equipment, certain practices around the type of parts that you're trying to build, you can actually have that baked in here. And the designer would have upfront have guidance on what to do or live while he was doing it. Hey, no, like and b even build in some quality checks around that. So that's what we kind of proved out is that it's interesting to have that as an advisor, but um, we'd have to build in more best practices around the companies. So, I think right now from like a 3D perspective, that's how we were, I think what we see is that having a baked in advisor would be a nice step forward to give uh, designers some best practices. So on that conclusion, we, we didn't do an exhaustive study on best practices here. What we wanted to just focus on is can you integrate chat GPT? Can we pull information? Can it provide some insight? Yes, it can. When we looked at the NX open code, we tested a whole bunch of the APIs, a little bit hit and miss, so it has some knowledge but some uh, wasn't able to do. So again, if you're looking to kind of automate a whole workflow, uh, you'll have some limitations there. It'll provide some snippets, but some other aspects you're gonna need expertise to, to go. Um, and again, I think um, this type of advisor would be helping just you know concept development, engineering principles, standards and regulations, but not in the 3D design itself, right? So again, people who are kind of worried about losing their job towards that, um, I, I don't think it's around the corner yet. Um, all right, so the last group in, this is maybe like a two-parter, um, the team center team. Oops. So um, they have a different reality. So I've got, you know, simulation guys a little bit more, you know, proud of their work. Uh, the NX automation guy is very left to develop. Let's integrate. Let's see how we can pack it in. And I've got the PLM people who are always have to deliver projects on time, on budget, just thinking, how can I make my life easier? How can I get all the answers that I need to deploy this, configure grid, and make my customer and make the PLM roll out as successful as possible? So the first thing they did is they said, okay, let me see what it knows. What does ChatGPT know about Team Center? So they came up with 15 questions spread between some easy and some hard and they did a qualitative score to rate usefulness and accuracy of what GPT knew around Team Center. So this is, or I'm missing two things here. So this is the result of the first test that we did. So usefulness means, hey, it was interesting, it taught me something. 
So, uh, and this is rated on 10, so you can see easy questions and hard questions about the same. So generally it gave me something that would help me understand better, like, oh, what type of workflow should I consider? Well, look, these are the different type of workflows that you could consider in your, in your process. But when we got to specifics, well, how do I implement that workflow? The accuracy was really low, like two or four on 10 is quite trivial. It just means some it got right, some it got wrong. It's kind of hard to know, would it really be useful? So we didn't really have accurate data to do that in. What was interesting is something existed, like a new team center. So, so when they trained chat GPT, something was scraped off the internet, they had a bunch of data, and they were able to have some knowledge out of it. Um, so they didn't stop there, though. The PLM guys like, wait a second. There's a ton of documentation that exists. There's a ton of information. How could I leverage that, right? Not everything was accessible. So we, we, we thought about it a little bit further. And that's what I think this is where large language models are going right now, is there's a lot on the market, but they're basically trained on general data. And for how companies can use them, it's how they can provide their own knowledge bases to it. So it's all about providing context, right? So we have these that can, pro like the large language models can process and digest questions and provide coherent answers, but if it doesn't have the right knowledge base, it won't be able to give you the answers you're looking for. So, I think now where we're gonna see a lot of things going is how do you augment the ones that are off the shelf with your own private data and how do you do that? So that's, that's where the team focused on, on, on getting that right. So OpenAI or ChatGPT, it's, it's coming soon. As you can see, this is an extract from the tutorial. So how to build and deploy an AI chatbot and understand multiple knowledge bases, it's not there yet, but they know that's, that's what's gonna come. Um, there's ways of doing it with the API and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and so that's, that's actually, that's exactly what we did is we tried to do a first version of this built with the API. So I have one way of doing it, so how to augment a large language model. Um, I put it up here for people who are interested with the, uh, the hyperlink and the architecture, but uh, in summary, you can take your local data, structure it, and then query GPT. Now, our primary concern with this was still privacy. Okay, so we were still sending stuff to GPT, and again, sent, even if they were saying, oh, it's safe, this and that, like customer data, our own IP, big hold back, we're not too sure, we don't wanna take a chance yet, still a little bit, uh, I wasn't getting nice thumbs up from my legal department. So we scratched our heads a bit, and uh, we went forward more with an on-prem large language model. So we were able to go with a open source LLM, um, take our own confidential data, go through a process of building our own vector database, connecting that together, and we could do that all on-prem and not have to worry about privacy. So for us, uh, that was the way to go to push this experiment a little bit further. So we went from testing stuff with ChatGPT to let's try something on-prem and see what that would give, all right? And this is what it gave. So from a usefulness point of view, similar. We had you know, maybe a little bit better, a little bit worse, but again, it, it got context. We were able to get some value out of it. But again, mostly this would be good for building an RFP. Like what should I consider? What should a PLM system have? What, you know, what option should I look at? What's the next step? Again, but accuracy is where it got much better, which was interesting. Um, we got, you know, still I'd love to see this go up, but a significant difference in the quality of the answers that we were given. So, for me, what this means is that, like, hey, if we provide the right data and ask our large language model to say, answer this question, but looking at this data, we can get more accurate results. And I think that's what is going to be interesting in the next months or next, I say months because I normally I'd say years, but things are moving so fast with this that I'm thinking it's going to be months now. Um, but um, so th this is a quick summary of how we've looked at this. So from our point of view, GPT, um, I'd say privacy, yes, but work in progress. I still don't like sending stuff online. Um, you know, it's limited the amount of information that we could augment it with, which, which you can throw in the prompt. You can do more with the API, like you can, it's possible, but there's still limitations there. Um, we had more control with our own version, so specifically to focus on the right data that we were providing it, and that showed in the results. So when you ask a question of GPT, if you've played with it, you could see you can re-ask the same question, it'll give you different answers a little bit, and it'll vary. They actually have a randomizer in there that gives you a variety of results. Um, in ours, we were able to control it much more. So 
I mean, if I'm an engineer and I'm looking for an accurate answer, there's not five different answers. There's typically supposed to be one, and it's, I'm supposed to be able to trust it and move forward on how to do a workflow or how to do certain things. So that was important to us. Um, usefulness is the same, and again, the accuracy was higher. So for us right now at Maya, like, where we're heading is, you know, developing, you know, our expertise and our approach to augmenting large language models in-house so that we have full control and privacy and that we can put all our data on there and, and, and leverage that. And I think that's what will be a new practice inside organizations coming in the next short while. And so what's next for us on that front, um, what you're seeing here is a brief video of just what we have working internally, right now, working right now. But I guess some of the highlights of this is that because we do it internally, let's talk about more controls, we can give it confidence thresholds, and we have traceability of data. So I can quickly find out, this is just an example question, they ask this question, where are you getting your answer from? What page is it? What's the confidence level? So if you've got you know, a history of data in your organization and you want to leverage that, we found this to be much more interesting to move forward with in confidence, because you can kind of go double check. It's just not like it's giving me an answer and I don't know where it got it from, right? So. For us, the next steps to expand this a little bit is going to be around model ingestion. We focused on PDFs to start, but getting more data inside, actually looking at OCR for a variety of historical data, uh, adding some additional controls. And let's say our internal target use cases to start are you know, contracts. Like I just love the idea of we're doing a headlamp thermal simulation project that I could just be like, help me write up a contract on this, making sure I've got all the right assumptions and historical things that have to take into account for it to be successful. Um, technical support, you know, uh, Maya, as you know, as being a Siemens VAR, we've done thousands of cases of answering questions. I can feed it into there and leverage that. So that's one of our next cases internally. But again, I'm saying internally because, you know, externally, once, you know, we're, we're refining this, um, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of value to do this uh, for our customers as well, whether it's around technical documentation. So anyone who's got worksheet instructions for manufacturing. It's like thousands of pages to do that, and there's a lot of historical data there. So if you can feed that into there based on a part, automatically generate a worksheet instructions or services manuals, technical documentation, that whole process that we know is quite heavy at the end. So this is not 3D engineering, but it's still the technical documentation of it. And I think that's where we're going to see it. So you can take your own in-house documentation and add that to a large language model there's going to be a lot of efficiency gains to be had here. So this is something, you know, short term, we're looking at accuracy control. Uh, but I think this is where it's going to be really interesting for organizations to look at where they can get gains on the short term. So going back to people worried about their jobs, not engineering, not simulation, stuff like that. This area, I think it's going to help the people that do this job. It's going to make their job funner. It's going to make it easier to produce stuff. If anyone has to write long documentation, we've used it a little bit to write some technical reports and it makes our life much easier. So uh, that's something that I would keep an eye on. So to wrap it up, um, generative AI as an ex engineering expert advisor, I think we'd like to think that it's this. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, we're a little ahead of this guy, for those who remember Clippy from back in the day. So it's a little smarter than him, but uh, we're still far away from Jarvis. Um, Generalize a knowledge advisor, like uh, augmenting LLMs, like I said, we've just proved that, hey, you can build an AI with a custom knowledge database. It is achievable. You can do it. It takes a few lines of code and a little creativity. Um, accuracy can be improved. So that's the direction that you want to go in with whenever you do this initiative. Um, that is the direction we think that this market's going to go quickly, is how to do that uh, at a company level. Now, the only question is, are people going to do it on-prem, on the cloud? What's the trust level going to be with with Chat GPT or other providers. Um, and things are moving fast. So I gave a version of this presentation four months ago, and I have to admit, or the last two weeks, I had things to update just because things had changed so fast. Uh, last week, on November 6th, Chat GPT had a dev day. And even in that day, at dev day, they said they're going to offer to pay for copyright lawsuits, to give you an idea, is one of the headlines. So I was talking about concern over data. I'm not saying this solves it, but you know they know it's a concern for adoption, right? So they'll be tackling this as best they can. Um, they also talked about you know uh, they really chat GPT Turbo. 
So uh, I'm not going through all the details, but there used to be knowledge cut off till 2021. Now they're gonna bring it up to 2023. There used to be more limitations on the amount of data you can prompt. Now it's gonna be up to 300 pages. Still not like thousands of pages, but still it's, they know that's one of the requirements, right? So things are gonna evolve in that direction. So it'll be up to people to figure out what's, what's right for them. But so I think overall looking ahead, I, Maya, we think this is a very positive thing. Like, look, it's gonna be another tool in our arsenal that we just have to learn how to use. It's gonna make work more interesting for our teams, for engineers, for companies. Um, it's gonna accelerate innovation, I really think. So it's just gonna change how we work. But I think we just have to monitor it closely right now. That's how our position is right now. I wanna keep the gap between what's possible and what Maya can do or what we can do for our customers to the smallest possible. And that's, that's what's tricky right now. How fast is it moving? How close do you stay? How much do you invest on that thread? So um, that being said, I'm done my presentation. And if you guys have any questions, I can take questions. If not, if you guys wanna talk about this more, I encourage you, this big QR code here, if you're just wondering, how do I get started? What does it mean? Okay, Renee, you said a bunch of stuff. I wanna get to know more. Scan that, book a quick call with us, and we'll gladly discover, uh, have a discovery call with you guys to, to explore more. Cool? Sure. All right, fantastic presentation. Thank you, Renee. We do have time for a few questions. Finally, I missed you in the previous two presentations, so this is great. Thank you. Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, chat GPTs, but so um, any opportunities I find to, uh, to learn a little bit more, it would definitely, and thanks so much for all this you know, great uh, ideas. Um, one of my questions actually were about that cutoff time, the knowledge, which was a big, big gap, obviously, 2021 to here. Now, because the knowledge, of course, are huge, and all these branches and all, um, what is your estimate in terms of related engineering and science, I, I mean, technology related to all these subjects that we are talking about, that part of the knowledge to helping uh, Maya HTT to basically fill that gap. Uh, that cut off time yeah. that is coming to April yeah. uh, 2023. If that's gonna make a difference for Maya, that perspective? Uh, I'm th thinking of, they are talking about that advancing the cut of time to 2023. Now, uh, how much of the knowledge, I mean, out there could help possibly a company like Maya to, to fill that gap? It's a good question. It, it, you know, they're, they're very little secretive on which data they actually use. So they know it's like for development, they pull a lot of stuff from GitHub. Uh, all of Wikipedia has been pulled in. I think that's like 3% of what the data that's been traded on. So they just scraped the internet for everything that they could to train on. So the question is, is what was added to the internet or the data set in the last two years that'll benefit everyone, right? So I think there's a few plays to that. So um, like engineering and science is quite, there's a lot of documentation out there. So like it, I don't know like if there's gonna be a big difference like for Maya with that cutoff, right? I think where people get interested like, you know, I was reading an article on um, Elon Musk's one, and the reason why he has his is he's gonna be able to tie it in directly to Twitter or X now. So having chat, you know, an LLM that's directly related to news on a daily basis is what uh, 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 is probably a goal of his there. So, so to answer your question, I think specifically on engineering or data, I'm not too sure because we'll have to wait and see actually what was done in there. So maybe there could be nice progresses in software development. I didn't speak about software development, by the way, but the, we've done a lot of experimentation on that as well, connecting it with Mendix, with SimCenter 3D. So if you have questions about what you can do around that, come see me after. We, we can speak about software development. But uh, it's, we're gonna have to see. We're gonna play with it again. Again, we're gonna have to keep experimenting and see what, what happens. Cool. Any other questions from anyone who hasn't? yet asked a question first. Let me just check. No? Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. That was great information for uh, even student. Uh, the, what we heard, I might be right or wrong, says whatever the CHEP GPT do have the right now information is till 2021. Uh, then after whatever we get, the responses are completely irrelevant. 
What are your thoughts on that, or what is information you have? So right now, Chat GPT-4 is running on data that was up to September 9, uh, 2021. 2021, is, is yeah. that correct? Yes. I read some Yes, yes. So they froze the data, they took a data set, and then they spent something like a year and a bit training it up, and then they released it, right? So it's like a static data set. So I think the challenge is to have dynamic data being continuously pulled in so that when you're asking Chad GPT what happened yesterday, it can do that. It can't do that right now. So all relevant knowledge of the last two years isn't in the training set. So what, that's been a little bit of a limitation. Depends on the type of work that you're doing, really. Uh, but so the recent release, they just said, hey, well, they've added a whole bunch of data up to uh, recently. So that's going to help. But again, I'm not, not too sure yet from an engineering perspective. But I think people are trying to write Students who want to write essays on recent news, it's going to help them out, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to ask your follow-up? So actually, uh, you talked about that a little bit. So I just uh, talking about those expert systems, probably uh, Maya is working on those private, basically, expert system databases to, to cover those period of time that is missing, basically. Yes, we are. Yeah, it's, it's an extension of our AI practice. And actually, uh, my colleague Remy, who I was talking about earlier, just joined us. So he'll be talking. I'm, I'm pointing to my friend over there. Um, but it, you know, so we have an AI practice that's around a lot of it, industry, manufacturing, engineering data. And this is just an extension of that practice that we have now, right? So as much as we're engineers and we're like, want to leverage these tools to analyze uh, industrial data, uh, this is just another tool now that we're developing so that we can build technical documentation or stuff like that that we've we just spoken about. So, yes, we are developing both of those. And I guess today I'm, I'm playing it softly here, but I'm interested. I have two hats we're giving at Maya. One is operations, so what's our team using at Maya to make us more uh, efficient? But also, you know, we're, we're an innovation company at the end of the day, and we're trying to bring stuff to our customers into market. So. This is something that we're going to be working on with that goal. Great. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Yeah. Please give it up for Renee. We're, we're, okay, we're yeah, yeah, time yeah. for questions. Thanks, guys. <laughs>